data visualization, visualizations allow for a particular type of visual storytelling, but also visual investigation. We can actually, um, uh, it provides uh, profoundly new ways to look at data and to understand data that we didn't have before. Um, so again, data visualizations offer this perfect example of the, of the possibilities and the potential of, of STEAM. What I, uh, what I want to uh, bring to um, bring to our light here is working through a couple of examples in which these data visualizations were used in a high school classroom in Los Angeles. So this was actually a pretty um, a pretty diverse uh, classroom for for LA. Oftentimes, when we use the word diverse, we mean uh, we actually mean very segregated um, schools. This was actually a, a racially diverse school, um, public schools, and the idea again was. How do you get young people to get excited about data science and the possibilities of data science? Mm -hmm. And the New York Times had carried these ama uh, created these amazing visualizations in, um, in the early 2010s um, that looked at a bunch of different issues, whether it's like Netflix data rental patterns. This is back when Netflix would send you DVDs in the mail. Yeah. Uh, do we remember that time? Um, and or to like uh, baseball uh, statistics or. Um, uh, other issues around like police, uh, uh, police uh, brutality, but they had a range of visualizations. So this visualization was offered to students as a way to think about um, uh, the ways in which we can infer racial patterns from um, from things that aren't explicitly racialized. So this was uh, the um, data re rental pattern for the Curious Case of Benjamin Button, which at the time was a really popular movie. The teacher presents it as a way of, oh, let's, let's look at um, this visualization and we're gonna contrast it with another one. Um, they present it and start talking about the, way, the places where it's not popular. So as you see, um, it's this, this area in, in, um, right next to Compton uh, where the, the color changes. So the teacher points this out in, in terms of thinking about why <coughs> might this be? And from, from the background, <coughs> one student shouts, shouts ghetto. And, and we know that the, uh, that area is one uh, historically African-American neighborhood in the, United, uh, in, in the LA area. And part of what we have to think about is when you read a map in the United States, you can't help but read it through the lens of race. Right? Given our histories of segregation, given our histories of redlining, all maps are racialized. Right? And so, um, a student brings this up, and um, the teacher, as, as, as we oftentimes are in these positions where it's really contentious, um, doesn't acknowledge uh, the, um, the comment. And it goes on to become this racial contestation. Uh, because uh, the, the teacher then goes on without acknowledging this next uh, uh, this map to this next, uh, next film that was shown, which is a movie called Not Easily Broken, it was a black, uh, black producer, black uh, director, black cast, uh, black, uh, black actors. And so uh, they ask, has anyone seen this? And there's uh, two African-American students in, in that class that say, we've seen it, and, we really, and they go on to explain how much they like it. Um, but in this, in this moment where it was just previously said ghetto, um, be this becomes a contestation over what does this mean? Uh, the, uh, the teacher continues to avoid it, um, thinking about questions around uh, um, publicity, publicizing, uh, to what extent did people know about this? But the two African-American students in there make this claim that this is about racial solidarity. They're like, we are gonna support our own. So they're using this, uh, this, um, this visualization to make a really profound um, and compelling argument around racial solidarity. And in fact, they are the only two that continue to use the, the data to make their arguments as well. Um, part of why, and we're not gonna go into this extensively, but the, part, uh, the reason I really wanna bring this up is that these data stories, these visualizations, actually become data contestations. And they all, that also means that they become contestations over the meaning of race. So within that space, Within that classroom, that this gets read through the lens of anti-blackness, through the lens of, um, of just consumerism, mm -hmm. and the lens of racial solidarity. Mm -hmm. 
and it becomes a contestation over these, um, th these multiple readings. But it's also important for us to acknowledge that this project was grounded in a commitment to engage and bring in students of color, particularly black students. And yet a moment that this is act actually instantiated becomes a place where they become further excluded from, um, from, the, uh, from the center of the classroom. And when, so when we think about STEM, and when we think about STEAM, what does it mean for us to do this work without a rigorous racial analysis? And so what I'd like to offer here is again, uh, with, this, with this project, um, and there are different narratives that are being told about this project, right? And, the, and part, but the narrative that oftentimes gets, gets told is this was an NSF project that was meant to, in, um, to involve and to bring in students of color. Um, and there are outcomes that they will show uh, about the, the larger, it was, um, that this project affected a number of students of color. But there's also these stories that are not told. And um, though, that's what I want us to think about in terms of what does it mean to center STEAM in this analysis, but also push aside or push away or obscure a rigorous analysis of race, racism, and racial, uh, racialization. Um, so the, the levels of centering STEAM and decentering racial analysis, I would argue, happen at multiple levels. One, it happened at the level of content and curriculum. If that example were to be used in that space, there should have been much more forethought in terms of, one, how to incorporate that, but two, how do we facilitate the difficult conversations that are going to emerge? Part of the possibilities of data science is that it's data rich, it's context rich. It brings in these wonderful uh, possibilities. But if it's gonna bring in these wonderful possibilities, to what extent are we prepared to then navigate those conversations or to facilitate those conversations? Mm -hmm. When do we know when to step in and when, when do we even step back and say, we need to revisit this? Or in order to understand this, that we can't read that map without understanding segregation. We can't read that map without understanding redlining. And what is it about it within STEM that we can have that humility to say that we need to look elsewhere to also understand this, whether it's to the humanities or to the social sciences. Um, so, so this was a question of, of content and curriculum, but it was also a question of classroom interactions. Each of us enter a classroom differently based on our racialized histories, based on how we're gendered, based on our, our um, uh, uh, relationship with this nation as citizens or non-citizens. So when we enter these classrooms, what does it mean for us to think about, at a core level, our positionality in, in uh, working with students in terms of facilitating these conversations of making sense together? And, I, and now the question of uh, positionality becomes rather perfunctory. Like I, I can say I'm a South Asian male, and that feels like that's supposed to do all the work, as opposed to saying, like, what does it mean for me to be in conversation with young people um, and understanding the, the, the complex multi, uh, racialized dynamics in that space? Mm -hmm. And if we are going to address the raci uh, racialized inequities that exist, to what extent are we willing to really deeply look at these classroom interactions. And finally, coming back to this question of school organization. And too often in these cases, when in my work with STEM teachers, is there's a way in which STEM teachers feel um, that they can ab abdicate responsibility when it comes to these more challenging questions. Mm -hmm. Where it says like, I'm not prepared for those conversations. Right. I can teach the STEM, yeah. but I can't have that uh, conversation about right. race. And yet that is our responsibility. Yeah, yeah. If we are thinking about racial uh, inequality and injustice, that is our responsibility. Yeah. It doesn't matter what, whether we're a STEM teacher or a yeah. humanities teacher, right. right? It is our core responsibility. So how do we think about school organization <laughs> to actually support the, um, uh, the capabilities of teachers across the, across the school to have these conversations? Um, and they are difficult, right? I, I oftentimes think like, if I were in that position, I wouldn't have, none of us have go-to an, uh, answers in terms of how we're gonna follow through with that. Mm -hmm. 
but yet how do we how do we support each other in building the capacities to um, to engage ourselves and, and and each other in that conversation um, so within all of this is is really coming back to these questions what is our theory of change just getting students of color to think of uh, to think about data science or to study data science is not a theory of change. That's not gonna fundamentally shift anything within schools or within society. And, and what is it gonna mean to, in terms of substantive changes in terms of the work that we do? Um, so I'd, I'd, uh, I'd bring this together by saying like STEM, even with the arts, absent of rigorous racial analysis is gonna result in the reproduction of the status quo. And so while we think about um, STEAM and we think about the arts, how do we really think about the world that we want and the world that we're moving towards? Um, given time, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm gonna curtail this part a little bit, but I do wanna just ask us this question, uh, this question, and that is, have you participated in an effort motivated by the intention to mitigate racial disparities that ended up sustaining or exasperating inequality. And so what factors have led to this outcome and what types of individual and collective intentionality could be helpful to prevent this slide? So I'm gonna leave that question um, yeah. uh, with, with us and just bring us back to this question of a few prompts towards authentic intentionality. And what I wanna be careful about here is not to assume that there's one way of, of being authentically intentional. Um, and I wanna be careful to say that there, it, this isn't formulaic by any means. And there aren't the deliberate steps that we can follow for authentic intentionality. Yet, I wanna leave us with just, uh, just four questions that we might ask ourselves. Um, so prompts towards authentic intentionality would, would entail this question, <coughs> for whom? And um, Tasha brought this up earlier as well, but oftentimes, especially in the United States in this current racial, uh, racial context, we are oftentimes inclined to say, oh, we want all students to succeed. This is for everyone. Right. Yeah. That's a powerful idea, and yet it erases specificity. Right? And, um, and um, one of our common colleagues and mentors Danny Martin has, has, has made this argument as well, right? This, especially this argument of for all children oftentimes erases black children in particular, right? And so how do we develop this question about for whom? When we're thinking about our efforts, when we're thinking about these initiatives, who are we naming? Uh, why are we doing this work? Who is it supposed to be meant for? Um, it brings up this question by whom? And this goes back to who are we? Right? How, is, um, how, how are we situated within the racial politics of the United States? How are we situated within larger historical, but also contemporary context as well? And what is our role in doing this work? So it means deep interrogation on our part. And sometimes it might be also being, it might be answered by, it's not our role to do it. Right? And um, so, but having that difficult conversation with ourselves becomes really, uh, really important. But also this question of with whom? Who are we in partnership with? If we're thinking about the beautiful work that was described today, who are we working with? Uh, whether it's uh, with the colleagues down, uh, down the hall, whether it's with parents, whether it's with the students, whether it's with community members, whether it's with artists, whether it's with activists, who, who is a part of this? And this, the collaborative work is challenging, and not all work has to be collaborative, but when we engage with it, how do we also have a theory of change around who we're working with? And finally, this, this question about to what ends. Um, ultimately, we can do STEAM in a way that reproduces the world that we have now. It can exacerbate the inequalities that, have ex that exist, we live in a world that's increasingly in, inequitable, right? Inequality in the United States has increased over the decades. <coughs> um, and so, st and, and STEM has been a key part of that growing inequality as well. Um, so the question is, what are the worlds that we wanna build together? 
Um, how do we anticipate being in relationship with each other? How do we uh, plan, uh, how do we expect to live in, in harmony um, and enjoy with each other, but also the earth and and uh, and the more than human that exists? What does it mean for us to do this within the context of uh, of the climate crisis, of uh, of the extreme inequalities that exist? And these are the questions that we need to be asking ourselves as well. If we're thinking about STEAM. What world are we are we hoping to create? Um, in the four minutes that we have left, um, mm -hmm. I just want to ask us just one question, but would love to hear um, for us to end on some of the thoughts and ideas that have come from this group over the course of the day. Um, so what is at least one tangible commitment um, you can make to ensure that your efforts in STEAM education address the persistent racialized inequalities and injustices in schooling? So I'm going to ask that we just take 30 seconds to compose our thoughts. And if we could have a few people just share a word or a phrase um, so that we can, uh, we can lift it together and we can take our collective voices as we leave this space as well. So let's just take 30 seconds to think about how, how we might engage with this. I mentioned this in my presentation, but, I, and I, I'm like, but I'll name it as a tangible commitment. But I, I really want to um, commit to supporting my students and having fun and having fun together. Because they're, they, especially this is like, a, I teach at a very expensive private college. And so the stakes for students are extremely high in terms of like meeting curriculum goals mm -hmm. and things like that. But it keeps them in a, it keeps them like really in like lockstep with just like of being like obedient mm -hmm. in a way that I think doesn't allow them to reflect or experience their own part in inequality and injustice and also to not see other people's um, experience. And I think if they're, you know, invited to be in playful relationships with one another more often, that I think it creates a foundation where we can have more difficult conversations um, because there's just a little bit more spaciousness. Thank you. Playful relationships. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm working on having the curriculum more student-centered and actually generated from students. seating chart and equitable classroom management. Um, so example, if I'm enforcing a rule on Jalen, I'm also going to be enforcing that rule on Rachel. And just remembering that, especially in the moment, because mm -hmm. students are very quick to go, hey, that's not fair. Why did you tell me <laughs> to sit down, but you didn't tell Rachel to sit down? And so just to remember, especially in those moments when things get heated or when firecracker personalities all get together. Um, it's really important to enforce both a modular seating chart and because a classroom, in my experience, has always been about personality Tetris. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sure. One last comment. Yeah. Um, in the dismantling of structural racism, um, the, the term activist or activism 
is always sort of placed like, oh, it's the people with the signs and they're picketing and this and that. But actually, activism is in every single interaction one can have in the world. And so my responsibility to my students is to say, um, when you have a choice, you have a choice. Let's think critically here. You have a choice to, to constantly reframe uh, how structural racism impacts uh, your community. And you can do it in very small ways, and you can do it in very big ways whenever you're ready to do it, but to be conscious of it. I mean, I, I hope and try that in every situation that I can um, be a part of a collaboration of, of minds, that, that, that unpacking the idea of what change looks like is really my responsibility, and that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and, I, and I want to hope that my students bring that forward more, like my Perez in the back, who mm -hmm. is unpacking things for me all the time, constantly. <laughs> so um, I really, uh, because I think people think, oh, let's let those people do it. Those people who are radical, or those people who are out in the street, when in fact there's every single interaction one can possibly imagine to undo it. Mm -hmm. Whether it's in school or out of school, with your family, not with your family. The, certainly the war in Israel has brought that so forward in my own communities. Um, it's been really intense um, how, how to hold space for what is right and wrong. And people are so polarized and oh my god, I've never seen it like this. Um, anyway, I don't mean to go on and on. But. Let's go there and there and make things in I always felt like I was his real specimen because I would travel in from the urban area from on the bus or in the BART and everybody else, they were minority students, but they came in from around the Bay Area in the suburbs. Uh, but there was about 30 of us. And it was once, you, you know, the, but at least my experience um, that when, when the students are taken out from hostile environments and have an expectation and to uh, be able to have that space to uh, to be heard and, and to uh, learn about different things and there's this uh, environmental study mm -hmm. a big six meter and uh, from the Department of Natural Resources with a professor at Then we went in as our summer program the next year. That was high school and then summer school here on campus. And then the 12th grade was the, um, that program they have where you go in and you're freshman. And then we, we had math um, Friday classes. We were like sections, discussion sections, all together, all 30 of us as a freshman during the regular school year. And, um, we got to upper division, then everybody spread out into their di disciplines. Mm -hmm. and I was only civil engineer, structural engineer, and uh, that's when things got real. <laughs> and, and thank you, Mommy, for especially sharing uh, you know, the power of sharing uh, your story and uh, uh -huh. what you shared with us today about the, uh, the Turtle Island Monument and just how important it is for all of us in this space to, to hear hear those stories mm -hmm. and just the generosity that, that you brought in sharing that story with us. Mm -hmm. And I thank you especially for that. Absolutely. And um, mm -hmm. yeah. so um, the commitment because that you feel like you're making so many but one that I feel like I can keep is just it's not even it's intangible but to continually like peel back and question my own expectations about it. 
excellence and worthiness in every single statement and kind of just be aware that I'm constantly forming judgments because mm-hmm. I am, but to like bring awareness to those judgments and be willing to like shed them every day mm-hmm. and like really, really be aware of that and like really radically accept everything mm-hmm. as being absolutely worthy. I want to close with one thought and it relates uh, to what Kim shared as well. Um, a thought that I oftentimes uh, think with, with some of our students here, and that is what would it mean if we approach every moment of teaching as an ethical and political <coughs> So, so often we think about the political or the ethical <coughs> or the activist work happening at, at a level that's way beyond our reach. But every interaction, every moment, every moment we're in (coughs) in relationship with each other is also a moment for us to engage in ethics and politics, right? And for us to approach every moment, um, and that's not to say that every moment will be perfect, because it won't, but to recognize that every moment has the power of being an ethical or political act, and for us to embrace that with all its, its weight, and all its power, but all its promise as well as teachers. Um, and so I, I hope this is a conversation we can continue. Um, I hope this is a, a space that we can continue to build. And um, thank you for all the wonderful learning across today from all of you.